Oh, take my tea. Can't leave that behind. Okay, so when you evaluate, please say bio is too long. <laughs> so uh, I got to hook up here. Okay. So I don't always use a PowerPoint, right? So uh, I apologize for any of those. Apparently, this is online streamed. So, uh, but I understand that the PowerPoint will be put up on the website or something along that lines. So, uh, I'll try to be descriptive, and uh, but I apologize to the online if there's you know the seven million of you out there who tuned in to watch Negan Sinclair, you know. <laughs> actually, I think my girlfriend's watching from Winnipeg. I think, although I doubt it. Actually, she'd be like she'd probably pick sleep over the over, but not to you know so. Uh, so, bonjour and dinway maga deduk, ni gan wei wudam ni jna kaas na magushin do dem ni min wenda mo mai yain. It's a uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and it's a pleasure to greet you in my language, the la the language of this territory, and the uh, the language of my people, the Anishinaabe, who uh, who have been here for a very long time, you know. And uh, my my experiences, my life is due to the you know millions of ancestors and relatives that I have in this territory. Not just human, you know, and we're going to talk a little bit about who, who are the, who are our audiences and who are our participants and who are our relatives in these territories. Uh, I'm going to ask you this morning, you know, normally I'm teaching a class of uh, 250 first year students. And so, you know, you're all awake, so you've already defeated them. And None of you have staring at you know laptops and Facebook in front of me. So, uh, so I'm going to try to be a little bit interactive. So I'll try to maybe you know pose a few questions and get us to think a little bit. Um, but I just recently spoke to I did that a lot. But um, I just recently spoke to the International Indigenous Librarians Association, and you know I kind of I've spoken to a lot of librarians over the years, uh, Manitoba Library Association, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, and so on, and. Uh, most of those conferences, everybody was pretty quiet. And then I went to the International Indigenous Librarians Association, and it was like one big party the whole time. People were yelling at me, heckling. It was like being in a comedy club. People are heckling me, and and so you know, feel free to if you want. I'm used to it now. So, uh, so this is my you know, this is the stuff that I do. Uh, it, you know, one of the things that I like to to mention is you know, I've got a few, couple books, so I'm, I'm happy to talk about those things. I'm not going to talk about them today. But my newest book, which is The Winter We Danced, which is the compendium or the collection of writings that happened during the Idle No More movement. Um, a lot of people don't know, but during the Idle No More movement, there was this huge cacophony, this avalanche of writings that took place online. And so myself and a, and a some, you know, group of other Indigenous academics and scholars and thinkers and activists got together. We made a book together, and we're called the Kino Dunemi Collection. But this is the stuff that really matters. So the bio is all nice and everything and talking about Al Jazeera and being on TV and stuff like that. That's all nice and good. But really, this is the stuff that really matters. You know, um, I'm going to talk a lot today about ceremonies. I'm going to talk a lot about perspectives, uh, perspectives from ceremony. And how do we begin to think of what we might, you know, define as, in, as indigenous literacy? I've already had a few people comment on my shirt this morning and how might we begin to understand and read this shirt as an example of indigenous writing that has existed for tens of thousands of years and a writing tradition that is as powerful as vibrant as creative as intellectual and as as worthwhile as any other text that's been performed in the past 500 years any other privileged text that this country is built upon and I'm going to ask you this morning I'm going to ask you you know What's a library? Like, what, you know, and I feel weird saying this to a bunch of librarians, you know. What's a library, right? And how, how do we begin to define what a library is and what it can be and what it should be? I work at the university. Uh, my life is, I'm, a depart I'm the department head of Native Studies at the University of Manitoba. So, you know, I'm constantly filling out reports for libraries, uh, resources. If we're going to develop a new class, we have to have the, the resources to support that class and so on. 
So is that me, by the way? Am I, am I the one that's is it bumping those? No, that's not me. Oh, that's upstairs. There's a party upstairs. Nice. OK, good. Oh, so, oh there's construction. OK, I just was wondering if that was me bumping, you know, bumping into something, or it was my heartbeat. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so you know, what is a library? Now, increasingly, I ask my students this question. I say, what's a library? You know, and, or what's an archive? My, my colleague Warren Cario gave this really brilliant talk at the International Indigenous Libraries Association where he asked the audience, he said, what's an archive? You know, what is the knowledge that we want to preserve? How do we begin to think about the preservation of knowledge and the preservation of text? Well, my students can increasingly think this is a library. Fewer and fewer, and we don't like to hear this, but fewer and fewer are walking into libraries. They're now sitting in their laptop and they're accessing libraries via the internet. Less and less are accessing places like these. You know, when I was growing up, this was the place to be. If you wanted to, if you wanted to go write a paper, this is the first place that you went. Now, the first place you go if you're a student is here. Actually, I, I do a little poll at the beginning of my year and I say to my students, this is first years, I say, how many of you have been in a library physically in the past year? And very, you know, about a third of the audience. This is a 250 person class and about a third will put their hand up. So that's interesting that that trend is continuing. And I wonder, you know, I hope that that's a dialogue that you're thinking about it, you're discussing, that you're engaging because, you know, there's so many issues with ongoing issues and emerging issues with the use of the internet and credible sources and so on and so forth. But, you know, when we think of libraries and we traditionally defined a library, we think of these places, right? So we think of these halls of knowledge, these collections of data, the collection of texts, the texts that are worth knowing. In many ways, and I don't really need to tell you this, but libraries are the, they're the places where knowledge is valued. They're the places also that determines what knowledge is valued. And then in the end, you know, on the backside of that, that, they're the places where policy comes from. They're the places where creativity is often defined. Libraries are the places where power begins. Because this is the place that our courts are built upon. This is the place where our governments are built upon. This is the place where our schools are built upon, the place where we form the opinions or we influence the opinions of, of our children who that later become policymakers. And I, uh, I spend a lot of time talking to Canadians about what it means to be Canadian. That's most of my gigs, most of my talks that I give over the past four years since I've really started doing a lot of this work. And the number one thing is people say, well, you know, I learned it, I learned this, or I learned this in school. Here's where I learned this. And so, you know, the more that we can critically consider what is a library, I think the more that we can profoundly affect change. We can profoundly affect the ways in which we see ourselves as whatever you define yourself to be, a Canadian or Anishinaabe or Nehewak or Haudenosaunee or, or whatever you define yourself to be. More and more, I ask librarians, and for some reason I've been at a lot of librarian talks over the past year, um, that uh, church talks to, and I'm speaking next month to the atheists of Manitoba, I don't know where my trends are going there, but, but, uh, but I, you know, I, speak, and I speak a lot to indigenous groups as well too. Um, but I, I say, you know, can we think of libraries, what is an indigenous library? You know, what would an indigenous library look like? Um, what would an Indigenous archive look like? That's what I, I said when, to my partner, colleague, uh, colleague Warren Carew, Métis guy. And uh, it looks like this. Like, that's what, this is what an Indigenous library looks like. This is a place where text resides. These are places that authors exist. These are places that intellectual creativity exists. This is the place where all the knowledge that you need, all the knowledge that you would require, this is the place where power begins in an indigenous world. And I feel pretty comfortable making that broad general statement, having, a, you know, I'm, I work in native studies and so I, I spend a lot of time studying uh, tribal nations from all across North America. And one of the, the primary features that defines all indigenous nations is the deep interest in relationships with the world around. 
with the world around it, with the world around them, particularly that of the natural world. And, that, and the ways in which we can create those relationships, every single Indigenous nation has some kind of mechanism in which to understand the world around it, uh, often called an education system or you know, an intellectual system. And that is premised on the notion that the world has to be understood. So when an elder or when a medicine keeper looks out on the land and sees, they might see medicine, but they've got to look for things. They might, uh, a uh, sunrise ceremony keeper might look out and see, okay, well, this is the way the sunrise is going to raise, raise today. That's going to affect the way I do this ceremony. Or, you know, a clan keeper has got to be able to look out at that clan, that animal, that dodem, and be able to understand, okay, this is what's happening amongst that dodem, those makwar, those bear, or those, those namagoshin, in the case of myself, rainbow trout, which my family's been carrying that, that, that totem for a very long time. Indigenous peoples are profound interested, profoundly interested in knowledge and always engaged in an intellectual process every moment of their life, every moment. And it doesn't matter today if we're, we're talking about cities either, because in those cities, indigenous people are constantly looking out in the world and trying to figure out the relationships. How do things engage with one another? So I ask my students, I say, you know, like, what are we going to study this semester? What are we going to look at? And um, this is the work that I do. The work that I do is how do we read this place? Like, how do we read? And of course, I'm, I mean, I realize where I'm standing right now. I'm standing in uh, northern Ontario and, you know, nearby. But most of my work involves studying my own home uh, and studying my own, my own area. And I come from uh, Little Pegwis Reserve, which is about an hour north of Winnipeg. You won't find that on a map anymore because the government of Canada forcibly removed us in 1907 to what's now Pegwis First Nation. So, um, but I say to my students, how do we begin to read this? How do we read this? And you know, you, you look to maps, for example. Maps are the most predominant form of way in which we understand land. We understand the ways in which we engage with relationships in the world around us. Increasingly, with the rise of Google and the rise of the internet, students aren't engaged with this world anymore. They're, they're, they're moving, they're staying inside, they're, they're staying on, even on their beds. I've had students say to me, well, I write your paper when I'm in bed. I'm like, oh, that's nice. That's... And uh, they, don't, they don't, are increasingly not leaving the house. They're not engaging this world, even if they, you know, on the path to the library. So how do we begin to read this? How do we begin to read this world? Well, they asked a Cree, uh, an Ahawak guy, um, way back in uh, 1807, and they said, you know, how do you get home? Or how do you engage with the world around you? How do you travel from one place to another? How do you figure it out? How do you know where to go? And he drew, drew a map. And this was his map of northern Manitoba. This is, what he, this is what northern Manitoba looks like to a northern Cree in Manitoba. It's definitely not this. It's this. And understanding the difference and how we shape learners, how we shape readers, and how they read, if you could understand the difference between this and this, this one is a map, a very defined political geographical map where land is privileged, and then the other one, is a map where water is privileged. These are waterways. This is the way in which he, he, he said, um, this is the way I get home from the Paw to Split Lake. And there's three ways you can go. And that line just going to the right is all the way to Lake Manitoba, the huge lake in the middle of our province. Now, I really want us to think right now about literacy, because literacy is what forms the basis for what goes in a library. What we define as literate is what makes the library. If uh, you know the, the books are the walls, literacy is the paint, the mortar, the foundation. That's what's the foundation of a library, is the, def the, the way we define literacy. Now, I work in a university, as I've said before. So uh, literacy is a highly debatable and definable term. It's constantly under negotiation. It's constantly under examination. Um, not so much, I would say, within the historical trajectory of the country. Literacy has been a very defined uh, term. The, the term litera, and it wasn't always that way, the term litera 
is a Latin term which means of letters and so it's a term that emerges in the 15th century and so this this uh, this de definition of literature comes up distinctly at the exact same time of the colonization of North America L literacy doesn't exist as, as an idea until the 15th century and then it's used predominantly to teach uh, me young men on ships on how to keep track of resources what's coming in how many goods are being brought in? How much? How we can we keep track of things like, you know, uh, what will eventually become money, or so on and so forth. So that's literacy comes up as this idea of being able to track goods, and that's where that history of that term literacy comes from, is from that idea that we need to keep track of things. And literacy originally is just notches on a tablet. That's all it is of letters. Now, what is an indigenous literacy? It, does it exist? Is there such a thing as indigenous literacy? You know, because we might say to ourselves, well, you know, indigenous people never had writing, for example, or they never had text, or they never had books, or they never had a library. Well, I hope that we, be, we question that idea, because if we can answer those questions, we'll not only understand the current situation of today, of how we see Canada and, and the power structures that make up the foundation of this country, but we will understand the complete and history of Indigenous, non-Indigenous relationships in the country by understanding that those fundamental questions of what is literacy. Now, literacy is a whole bunch of things, right? So it's reading and it's writing and it's, it's literature and it's expression and all this different stuff. But, you know, I'll use a bunch of sort of highfalutin terms just for a brief moment, so you know, bear with me. Um, literacy is based on the idea of meaning, right? And it's the idea of the sign or the squiggle, you know, the thing that we decide means something. Uh, if you look down on your programs, you'll see a whole bunch of signs. Those are a whole bunch of signs. And the way that you understand them is called semiotics, right? So you understand the signifier, which this, the sign signifies something. And in the case of your programs, there's, it sounds. It's like, mm, or uh, or a f, or whatever. So your signifier, and that's how you make semiotics. And then eventually it represents written language. Well, that's what reading is. Now, I want to talk about an indigenous semiotic or an indigenous sign or a signifier. And I want to go all the way back to uh, initial first contact here in Canada. Now, first contact in Canada for Europeans, now I'm not talking about the Vikings, and I'm not talking about the, the, the trips between it for, that indigenous people took on sea to all across the world, which happened for thousands of years. Um, I t often tell my students, where do you think peanuts came from in Asia? That came from travels from North America over to Asia. You know, oceanic travel was a regular occurrence on this side of the pond. But let's talk about French or what we think of as modern European connections with indigenous peoples right here in what will now become, will soon become Kanata or Canada. Now everyone knows this guy, right? These are actual photographs from the day from 1531. That's why I always tell people, people are like, is that real? No. <laughs> it's a painting. And it's a drawing. And so, like, I know this isn't probably what really happened, but, you know, it's a representation. So, 1531, right? So, who's this guy? Everybody remember? You remember from school? Who's this guy? 1531, first European explorer from France. Champlain comes a little bit later. So Cartier. Cartier, yes. So. But Champlain's an excellent guess, excellent guess. Champlain actually probably has a longer and more influential history than Cartier. Cartier is, a, I'll just say he was a complicated individual. Uh, he w wasn't exactly a, a guy that made a lot of whole of friends as in his three trips over the pond. Champlain was a guy that actually kind of made friends, particularly with the Anishinaabe. But anyways, now, now Cartier... So Cartier arrives, right? So Cartier's goal of coming to the new world, you know, or the new, you know, we call it the new world, very much the old world for those who are here. <laughs> uh, then coming over the new world, what's his point? What's his point of coming over? He has two main goals. Spices and gold. That's what he wants. He wants spices and gold because the, the predominant resource in Europe at the time is spices, particularly spices from Asia. 
That's the profit-making mechanism. Now, there's this sort of illusion and this imagination and this dream that, that North America is this place where gold is just sort of regularly running down the water. Just got to put your hand down, grab the gold, and run as fast as you can. Like, there's this sort of imagination that North America is this place of gold and regular, you know, but you just got to find it, right? And so uh, I actually have lots of funny stories about explorers having done a lot of archival research. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll segue into this one little story because it's interesting. So, you know, in, uh, European explorers get to every indigenous community, always the first question, where's the gold? And then, uh, they, and then indigenous people are like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. And then, well, then they realize that the Europeans aren't leaving anytime soon. <laughs> they're like, they're just sitting there. <laughs> And so then the indigenous people always go, you know where the gold is? Just over there. <laughs> you know, just over the hill over there. Just, just keep going. <laughs> so actually almost every archival document kind of looks like that, <laughs> especially when you reach the Spanish. But anyways, so, so Cartier arrives, 1531, and he, he arrives down the St. Lawrence and he, he uh, you know, he's traveling down and he kills a few birds on the travel, probably for, you know, to collect them and bring them back and, and then Cartier lands, uh, and uh, what he thinks is is an empty, open area. lands lands his boat, and then you know lands for the very first time in what we now know as Canada. sets his foot down, and behind him is his men, and his men come in off the boat, and they're carrying this you know huge twenty five foot thirty foot cross, and at the top of this cross it says La Vie de Roi de France, La Vie de Roi de France. So long live the king of France. And they take this huge cross and they dig a big hole and they drive this stake, this huge cross into the earth, right at the, right at the foot of the shore. And they celebrate and they say, I declare this for new France. Meanwhile, in the bushes nearby, there's some people watching by and they emerge and they're led by this chief called Danakana, who's a Haudenosaunee. Iroquois, uh, St. Lawrence Iroquoian. And Donna Canna comes out and he quickly, uh, according to Cartier's records, indicates to Cartier that this act of putting this massive cross down is completely unacceptable. And Cartier even notes that in his, in his uh, recording journals or his recorder records it. He says, you know, Donna Canna is very upset He's very upset by, by Cartier's putting of this cross on this territory. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? <laughs> that tells you, <laughs> well, that tells you that, you know, what, what if I came into your living room and then I just, you know, I just put a big, huge, I just took a big picture of me and I just hung it on your wall. And it was like, la vie de Nigon. <laughs> like, how would you feel about that? You'd be like, what's this? Who's this guy? Now, eventually, if we created a relationship, if you got to like me a lot, you'd maybe put my picture up on the wall, maybe. But I got to earn that, right? And how do you earn it? Respect, time, gifts, maybe saying hello. Carche didn't do any of that. Cartier just came in and said, all right, I'm just taking over. It's my living room now. And so what does that tell you? That tells you that Donna Canna completely understood what the signifier of what Cartier was doing. What does that tell you? That tells you that Donna Canna knew what law was. He knew what respect meant. And he knew how when you walk into somebody's living room, that you maybe say hello. That maybe you bring a gift or two. And maybe, maybe... You show a little bit of respect. Donna Canna understood completely what writing meant. He understood that because this was an instance of writing. This was an instance of Cartier writing. Literally, if there was a map right there, Cartier would write New France. That's what he did when he said this is New France. And when he put La, La Vie de Roi de France, it's an instance of text. What does that tell you? Donna Canna was profoundly literate. That's what it tells you. It tells you that indigenous people completely understood what writing meant. Now, if you don't believe me, let's try, let's try something else. Now, 1671. Now, the French are very smart in their settlement of North America. 
unlike the British, now I don't mean to insult any British here. I'm British too. You know, I got, I'm from the Warren family going all the way back to England. So the British, um, they adopt this policy of not marrying into indigenous families. <clears throat> the French, however, don't have that policy. Um, the French, in fact, French traders adopt the policy of, of marrying into multiple indigenous families with multiple indigenous women um, to the point where it begins to become a problem. Uh, where I'm on a date in uh, you know 1995, and this uh, wonderful woman who I'm on this date with says, "I think you're my cousin," and <laughs> and then we traced it back to this French trader in the 18th century, and we're like, "Damn it, the Samards, that Louis Samard." Thanks, Louis. Anyways, a little bitter about that one, but anyway, so you know, um, but. Let's zoom to 1671. So 1671 in Sault Ste. Marie, very close to here. So, uh, or for the Anishinaabe, what we refer to as Bawating, uh, the, the place of the rapids. Now, um, there, you know, a French leader named St. Lucien comes across and he's traveling very quickly across the Great Lakes. Why? Because the French are very adept at creating relationships. Unlike Cartier, the French realize that if they're able to create relationships very quickly and what's called friendship treaties, or alliance treaties, they can move westward very quickly, particularly through the Great Lakes, where the British don't quite realize that. They decide they're just gonna come in and monopolize trade and, and continue to upset people. It's not until they get to the Hudson Bay where they realize a different method where they come through the Hudson Bay area into Manitoba. But St. Lucien uh, invites all the Anishinaabe leaders at Bawating. Now, if you know the power of Bawating or the relevance of Bawating, Bawating is one of the most sacred areas for the Anishinaabe. It's the fifth stopping place. It's fourth and fifth stopping place. It's the, it's the place in which Anishinaabe stopped for many, many generations. And many Anishinaabe still consider that to be sacred territory. Even during the War of 1812 and before that, um, the, the Bawat Bawating was the homeland of many Anishinaabe. It's the gateway also to Manitoulin Island. Now, St. Lucien calls all the Anishinaabe of the area together, just like this, exactly like this kind of gathering. And he, he stands in front of everybody and he says, okay, everyone, I want to create a treaty with you. I want you to be my brothers and my sisters. And so um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a treaty and uh, the French king is going to be your father. And the Anishinaabe are like, what? And the, the French is like, the French king's like, okay, so listen, we're going to make him your father. He's going to take care of you. And as a result, you're going to give us free reign in territory. You're going to only trade with us and so on. And the Anishinaabe are like, well, that's actually not so bad because um, if, if you have a caretaker for a family, somebody that decides yourself in your life um, for Anishinaabe, particularly amongst young men, that would be your uncle. So the Anishinaabe go, yeah, okay, we're okay with father, because you know, fathers tend to be taking care of someone else's children. So that's why if you look in the archival documents, the term father is often used and used respectfully, or the queen is the mother or the grandmother. If you use the term uncle, that would be a term of you'd be accepting the, the control of, an, of another being. You'd be, you'd be, because the uncle is the one who makes the decisions, most of the decisions of your life till you can. So St. Lucien says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a treaty, and it's called, we're going to call it uh, you know, our peace and friendship treaty, and we're going to be family from that point. So, they, so he puts down, he puts a metal stake in the ground, and then he goes and he signs it with his French name. And then he invites all the other chiefs to come up, and he says, you sign it too. And so they all come up, but they don't sign using their name. They sign using their dodem. And so the recorder says that the governor's delegate then attached to the stake an iron plate on which the arms of the king were painted. He drew up an official report of the transaction, which he made all the peoples by their chiefs, who for their signatures depict the insignia of their families. Some of them drew a beaver, others an otter, a sturgeon, a deer, or an elk. And what do the signatures look like? Unfortunately, that document no longer exists, but it looks like this. So 40 years later in Montreal, Anishinaabe, specifically from Bawating, these are the three Anishinaabe chiefs who attend the Great Peace of Montreal in 1701. Now the Great Peace of Montreal is the end of a 100 year bloody conflict between predominantly the British and the Haudenosaunee on one side or the Six Nations on one side, and then the Three Fires Confederacy and the Anishinaabe specifically, the Potawatomi and the Odawa and the Wendat or the Huron with the French or the Wemetagojiwak, as we called them, with the Jaganashak, against the Jaganashak, the British. Now, this is what the signatures look like. 
I want you to look at these signatures and the Great Peace of Montreal. And if you're online, please you know look it up. Um, the Great Peace of Montreal is the most interesting document in this country's history. But I can almost guarantee you that either A, you've never heard about it, or B, your students have never heard about it, but it is the reason this country exists. For 100 years, the entire eastern seaboard was engulfed in a massive conflict for 100 years. People would burn down each other's villages. They would kill, they would kill communities. They would go to forts. They would kill the British fort. Then they would go back and they'd kill the French fort. Then they'd kill the indigenous communities nearby. And for 100 years, it was massive conflict on the eastern seaboard till the Great Peace of Montreal. When 300 chiefs came together, along with the French and the Haudenosaunee, or the, the, the French and the, um, the British leaders, and they got together and they said, we should probably create, do something else. Let's create some peace, because we're kind of sick and tired of this war, this constant, constant conflict. We want to make a peaceful life for everybody. And the Great Peace of Montreal is the most important document, because it creates the nation. It creates Canada. It is a document that every child should be learning because it is also an instance of Indigenous leadership teaching non-Indigenous peoples how to live. Now, I want you to look at all the signatures. How do you know that I, how do I know that I know that, that Indigenous people are teaching non-Indigenous people how to live? Well, look at the signatures. Exactly like the, in 1671, when St. Lucian said, you know what, I'm going to come through this territory, I'm going to travel there. Anishinaabe said, as our relative, here's who you're going to meet. And not only here's who you're going to meet, but you're, here's the people that you're going to meet. And not just, I'm not just talking about the, the totem carriers, the people who carry those dotems of the beaver and the, the otter, the sturgeon, the deer, the elk. But here is the landscape you're going you're gonna to meet. Because fish don't just live in the air, they live in water. Deer don't just live randomly up floating around, they live in forests. Bears, rocks birds, trees, and so on. What the Anishinaabe were doing by writing for the newcomers was saying, here are the relationships you're entering. And as much as we, we recognize you as family now, that we share a father, and that you are entering a series of relationships that we have too, and that you are a part of the family. And when you come into the family, just like Karche, you know, you don't come in and start uh, throwing, you know, so you, don't come, you don't go into somebody's house and start moving the furniture. You don't go into someone's kitchen and start just helping yourself to the Captain Crunch. Although uh, that would be awful if you did <laughs> for yourself and for everybody else. <laughs> but you don't, you don't just walk into somebody's house as a family member and start pushing yourself around. Now, how many people have an auntie or a grandmother that they write, that, you know, or their uncle or a family member that they visit regularly? Yeah, right? Everybody does, right? When you, uh, now, I have my Auntie Diane. My Auntie Diane's my, one of my favorite people in the whole world. I, I love her very much. Um, my Auntie Diane, when I, walk, when I go to her house, first thing she does when I knock on the door and I give her a hug and I, is she sits me down and what does she do? She gives me food, yeah, or she particularly gives me tea or a pie that she's been working on, right? Or something like that. She gives me a gift. And then she says to me, immediately following that, she says, how's your day, my boy? You know, or she says, tell me about what's going on for you. How's work going? And then I tell the story. And then I say, and you, auntie, what's going on for you? How's bingo, right? Now, she, and then she'll say something like, well, I'm only doing 33 cards these days. And you're like, 33 cards? <laughs> My, my auntie should work for NASA. I'll just say that. But anyway, so like, you know, uh, what have I just told you? I've told you about a mechanism of gift giving that involves greetings, names, food, and then stories. And that's how indigenous peoples create relationships. That's called a treaty. That's how people create families. Because if you work hard enough, if you're lucky enough, your families are based on those premises, on, the, on those methods. And that's the way Indigenous peoples created relationships for hundreds and hundreds of years. And you can see it within the very treaty itself. Back in 1671, you can see when Carche had to learn what it meant. And you can see it all the way back to, up to 1701. You can still see it in 2015 in my auntie's house. Now, one other story about Carche. 
Karche uh, wasn't so great at relationships, eh? So he invites Donacana onto his boat. And uh, um, the second that he, Donacana comes onto his boat, he brings his two sons. He actually brings three sons, but he comes onto the boat. And Karche immediately, uh, you know, on the, under the auspices of trade, Donacana thinks they're going to have a trading relationship. Karche grabs Donacana's two sons and he captures them and he takes them under decks. And Donacana's like, what's going on here? Karche says, well, I just want to take your sons. I want to take your sons because I need them. I need them to show me where the gold and the spices are. And Donna Khan is like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't know what gold are. I got some birch tea. Does that help? You know? And Karche is like, no, I'm taking the sons. And Donna Khanna, for some unknown reason, decides to let his sons travel with Karche, probably to create a trading relationship with Karche. But now Karche goes up the St. Lawrence River. He doesn't find any spices and gold. Surprise, surprise or any spices particularly that he's interested in, a whole lot of medicines, a whole lot of life. But then he goes out to the ocean. And a few days later, the young men realize they're not coming home. And so <laughs> what do they say? <laughs> uh, you miss the spices and gold, turn back. <laughs> That's what the boys say. <laughs> but then they also say, Cartier says, where are the spices and gold? Where are the riches? Tell me where the riches are then. Wh where do I look for? And the boys say, the riches are in Kanata. The riches are in Kanata. And so, what does that mean? What does Kanata mean? Kanata is the word, Iroquoian word for village. And the young men have just told Karche where the riches are. But are they the riches that Karche wanted? Because the riches of a village are in my auntie's house in 2015. That's where the riches are. They're in the greetings, they're in the stories, they're in the food, they're in the love. That's where the riches are. But the riches that Karche wants is the spices and the gold. Now, for hundreds and hundreds of years, indigenous peoples have been writing. Hundreds of years. And not just hundreds of years, but thousands of years. There's only documentation for hundreds of years. But if you look at the archival evidence, the archaeological evidence, the stuff that science shows you, it's actually tens of thousands of years. The very first treaties of Manitoba had the same principles, the same principles when Chief Pegwis gave to Lord Selkirk uh, signifiers. And when he gave them the signifiers, he said, here are the people you're going to meet. Here is your family now. These are the beings that will teach you about the earth. These are the peoples that will sh help you read what you need to know about how to live, how to travel on the water. And so the bigger issue here is what is writing? What is the, how do we define writing? Because if writing is the value of a sign in the way in which we see a sign and we create a signifier, so if we see this and we create the word leaf, then who made the determination that leaf or these four squiggly lines right here is the be all end all of writing? When did that happen? And when did the, the idea of the semiotic or the idea of the signifier become that? become that was the one and only signifier that means anything. That's the knowledge, that's, that's the knowledge that we value, the, those squiggly lines over there. How is it that we can think about this? You know, uh, how do we begin to think about signifiers that exist for thousands of years? Now, the problem is the country is based on the exact premise I've just talked about, is that the signifier of placing uh, a, a 30-foot cross is the signifier that's valued. And the Supreme Court of Canada is based on this idea. Because in 1763, a few short years after the Great Peace of Montreal, when Indigenous peoples wrote and explained to non-Indigenous peoples on the landscape, here's how you live. Here's, the, here's the, the recognition that we are family. Here is the recognition of Kanata. Since 1763, King George, the, King George III or KG3, as I like to call him. It's, that's a street name. KG3 says, everything I see belongs to me. And he passes the Royal Proclamation. The Royal Proclamation um, is the document that you've probably learned about. It's not the Great Peace of Montreal, but the Royal Proclamation is probably what you've learned about. The Royal Proclamation is the beginning of Canada. That is the premise and the foundation of the country. The premise and the foundation of the country is that everything I see belongs to me. 
That's, this, that's what King George III states. He says, indigenous peoples have what, the, what we'll call title or will eventually be called title, but it's limited title because it's only title insofar until I get there. And then when I get there, they have to sell to me and they can only sell to me at a price of my choosing. And then after that, they have to go to an area that I set, a, set aside for them called a reserve. Now, KG3 is not a guy that's, uh, that's all that invested in the survival of Indigenous peoples, but he is invested in the, in the idea that they will be separate. They will just get out of the way of progress. Now, the problem of this is this seems all kind of absurd, and this seems very Carterian, if I were to use a verb, uh, you know, seems very Carter-like to kind of just walk in and go, well, this is all mine now. But it sounds like this, you know, if, if I said right now, you know, I got the addresses of all of your homes, I'm going to go there sometime in the next week. I'm going to knock on your door and I'm going to buy your house for five bucks. Now, I'm not a mean guy. I want you to live so you can live in the bathroom for the rest of your life. Now, you can live in that bathroom. If you complain or if you try to leave, I'm going to put a guy outside your door called a bathroom agent. And that bathroom agent's going to make you stay in there. Why? Because he has a gun. If you try to leave, he'll hurt you. Now, I'm not a terrible guy. You know, you can come out once a year for 15 minutes. You can come and collect maybe a few scraps of food in the kitchen, but you got to go back to the bathroom right after that. You have to get a pass from the bathroom agent to leave. Now, here, you know, I'm not a mean guy. Uh, now, while I'm enjoying your, sorry, my big screen TV in the living room, I'll be thinking about you. You can write a letter if you want to complain, but you have to give it to the bathroom agent. I'm sure he'll make sure that he gets to me. No problem. Oh, yeah. And the other thing, too, is, is the... Uh, um, if you have any kids, you can have a few people live with you if you want in the bathroom, but if you have any kids, I'm taking your kids. And I'm going to teach them that everything in the bathroom is awful, because it is. The bathroom kind of sucks. It's small, it's cramped, it's kind of smelly. It's not so great. And I'm going to take, I'm going to teach them, and good luck if those kids ever want to go back to the bathroom. Now, here's another thing. It's going to cost me a few bucks to, to keep the lights going on in the bathroom. I'm going to keep the five bucks. Now you can do a few things, but you got to dress. You got to wear the clothes that I tell you to wear. You can't speak too loudly, and no one can come and help you. You can't go hire like a lawyer to come help you get out of the bathroom because lawyers are banned on my property. Now everything I described to you happened as a result of the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Everything, everything I just described to you, it's called the Indian Act, right? And some of you I noticed began to recognize what I was doing there. You start to go, oh yeah, okay. That's the Indian Act, that's the Indian agent, that's the past system, that's the banning of ceremonial dress, that's the banning of languages, that's the, that's the removal of children into residential schools. And that creates the situation of today. We're living in this house built on the premise of the Royal Proclamation of 1763, and we have people still locked in bathrooms. Now, we don't have laws today that keep them on bathrooms, but that's called poverty. That's called limited education. That's called two-thirds funding for Indigenous children on First Nations communities, whereas, you know, than every other children in the country. The problem of the country is that it was based on writing. It was based on the value of text. And I know this very uniquely and very intimately because this is the story of my community. In 1907, they held an illegal vote because it was in the way of Manitoba progress. Manitoba was bu building this, you know, the postage stamp province. It was becoming one of the economic hubs. The train line was coming through, and the Indians were in the way. My community was in the way. Even though we were the most Christian settlement, we were the most, uh, we spoke probably the most English. We definitely spoke a whole lot of Cree, but we, spelt a, we also spoke a lot of English. And we, uh, we were the most, the best farmers in Western Canada. We we're, so, were so good, we defeated all the other farmers in and around Selkirk. People were jealous, people were upset that the Indians were doing so well, particularly the St. Peter's Indians. And so in 1907, they held an illegal vote. And what they said is they said, without any announcement, just 50 minutes warning, they held, put a big rope in the middle of the community. They said, anybody who wants $90, stand here. Anybody who doesn't want $90, stand here. There was no record of who was voting was kept, and there was no explanation of what the vote was about. 123 wanted $90, 97 didn't, which should tell you a little bit about the resistance of, to $90. For the next month following, we were forcibly removed. And the argument was, 
you have no land claim. There's no land. Show me the piece of paper. The piece of paper that matters is this surrender document that your community just voted for by standing on the earth. And many of those people weren't even part of the community anyways. Unfortunately, this is the history of Manitoba. The history of Manitoba is the removal of the Sayasi Dene, the removal of the Chemawawan Cree, but we call that Manitoba Hydro now. We flood out the community. And we say, oops, sorry, well, here's some money, but we made a dam because you didn't have a claim there anyways. Residential school is the same thing. You're unfit parents. We need to put them into, we need to put them into schools. The 60s scoop. Your, your, your practices are savage and heathen in this household and we need to be removed. Bill C-45 in 2013 is the exact same premise. The exact same premise by the Harper Omnibus legislation is that Indigenous communities can be removed no longer due to from 60% of the community, but now all you need is three people and you need to give 24 hours notice for a vote. Boy, does that ever sound familiar. Does that ever sound familiar? So the Harper Omnibus legislation for the building of the pipeline out in BC is specifically for the purposes of being able to cross First Nations, 14 First Nations communities in Northern British Columbia. We're still doing it. We're still taking a 30 foot cross and are driving it into the earth. Now, all of this is problematized by the fact that indigenous communities have land claims, they have writing. They have things that describe their relationship with territory. What is a legal document, but if not the description of relationships? This is how people will operate. This is how the property line will run. This is how the farmer will interact with the land. Those are all laws. Indigenous communities had these. The Mayans had them. The Mayans had probably the most extensive writing system. They had codices that they would lay out in the community. They'd have huge pieces of, of uh, papyrus paper and you know they'd lay them all out and medicine knowledge keepers would explain these large pieces of paper to the community the Sayasi Dene had them but they had they used rock face and if you look very closely at the these ongoing writings which they still continue to add to every year these are stories of creation but stories of relationship so I'm no expert on the Sayasi Dene or sorry not the Sayasi but the the Anasazi sorry this is the Anasazi I'm no expert on the Anasazi but the Anasazi um, are telling a story of their relationship. Here is the unknowable and the knowable, the, the story we might think of as the corporal and the incorporal, or corporal and incorporal, or the spiritual and the real. And what we, the things that we understand, the things that, that perhaps are in between the things that we understand, and that in between those things are us, human beings, through our thought and our vision. That these texts, we have the ability as human beings to see anything we want to see. We can read anything we want to read, what we see, what we, what we make sense of, the semiotics that we want to see. Now, indigenous writing systems have been going on for tens of thousands of years. There's, there's um, text written in sand, text written on rock, text written on trees, and not just human text too. Because if any of you have ever seen an animal mark, a, sorry, a bear mark a tree, what is the bear telling you? Well, he's telling you, uh, here's how big I am, and here's my territory. And if you're a female bear, here's some scent you might want to follow for a visit later. Now, uh, bears are, are writers. Bears are authors. Now, indigenous writing systems, by this point, I hope that you see my argument. My argument is that indigenous writing systems are highly intellectual vessels. They're vessels that not only tell you about your relationships, but then how to live in your relationships, who you're going to meet along the way, how to interact with those beings, interact with them as family. And that not only do you can travel, but you can also learn a whole lot about the landscape. You can learn about the stars. You can learn about places. You can learn about names of places. You can learn how, even how to make peace after 100 years of bloody conflict. So all of these things exist in indigenous writing systems. And I want to show you one, which is the, this, this, the story of the migration of the Anishinaabe. This is the uh, birch bark scroll that James Redsky kept for hundreds of years that explained the migration of the Anishinaabe. It's our creation story, our creation story that tells the story of how I got to be here in 2015 at the Ontario Library Service North Conference. Because the migration for the Anishinaabe is still happening. We're still moving. 
We, we may have started out near New York and in the uh, Atawaki Nation, and we, but we moved over hundreds of years, and we stopped in a place called Bawating along the way. And we met with a man called St. Lucien, and we agreed that he would be family. And then we kept moving, and we had more stopping places. We eventually ended up in a place called Manitowabo. And Manitowabo is this place where the life lives on the water. The life comes from the water. That's what that word means, Manitowabo. Manitowabo is the, the spiritual, the essence that comes from sacred water. Manitowabo, Manitoba. And so and that's, that's how we trans, that's how we, this is a, a regular map from the Mishomas book, a great book if you have a chance to look at it. Um, but this is the original birch, birch bark scroll that talked about our travels from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to Leech Lake. In Manitoba, these, are, these stories take place on rock faces. These are rock paintings that take place. And if you start here, um, right here in Sudbury, and then you move west, north, uh, east, sorry, yeah, northwest. You go northwest from here, you'll find what James Dumont, or Jim Dumont, who gave, gave me my name, um, talks about as a quarter of Anishinaabe texts, all written on rock faces, on trees, on landscape, in the very footprints of the Anishinaabe. And that on the very, um, you know, they just discovered 193 hearth, uh, fire hearth at the forks. This is evidence of text. These are evidence of not only just settlement, but also evidence of presence and the story of people's lives. So let's go back to the map of 1806. So <clears throat> Peter Fiddler, who's a map maker in Manitoba, goes to Northern Manitoba and he says to Chewapiwati, which is a man who's a traveler, he's going from the paw. And here's the paw right here. Anybody know where the paw is? The paw. And he's going to Split Lake. And he says, how do you get home? He says, well, I can go this way. And here's all the people I'm going to meet along the way. Or I can meet this, go this way, and here's some other people I'm going to meet along the way. Or I can go this way, and here's some other people I'm going to meet on the way. All of these things represent water flow. And they represent the ways in which families interrelate with one another. They represent the ways in which people interconnect. They talk about the history. They talk about the relationships. They might even tell some stories about who's marrying who and which community has which, you know, who's had a baby this year. Um, they might tell a story about the family that lives on this river and how they've been warring with the family or arguing with the family at this river, uh, up, right up the river here. Now, there's a whole history, there's a whole life that lives within this map. And so Manitoba Hydro, uh, who uh, I've had a contentious relationship with in the past, um, but has done some very good work in Manitoba, you know, has brought electricity particularly to Winnipeg, um, and now is transporting electricity to Minnesota to sell and to is Manitoba Hydro's argument is that when they make a, what's called consultation or Section 35 under the, under, you know, what's called the spirit and the intent of, you know, the, uh, of Aboriginal and treaty rights, Canada recognizes Aboriginal treaty rights, Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution, what's later called the spirit and the intent of treaty. When they negotiate, they'll say, okay, so we want to build a dam. So here's the dam right here, this little orange spot right here, the, the new kiosk generating station. And we know that there's going to be some environmental damage here. It's going to stop water flow and stuff like that. So let's talk to the communities right here. Let's talk to these communities, these two communities here. Let's make a negotiation with these. Well, here's the problem. The problem is, is that it affects more than that. And, for, and Indigenous peoples have been telling people this for hundreds of years, since 1806. Chewa told Manitoba told people, told map makers, he said, if you do something here, you will affect all of these people's lives. So when you consult, you have to consult with everyone because that's what families do. When I come and I put my picture up in your house, I should probably talk to everybody in the house because everybody's going to have to look at my dirty mug, you know, in your living room. Well, my living room or yours. Now I want to end off by saying, you know, how do we read Canada? How do we begin to look at Canada differently? And when we make our libraries, how do we begin to recognize the power that we have? Or you probably have already done that. How do we then modify and engage and, and influence the readers that we are creating? Because Canada is very much a place of spices and gold. We're still today pursuing Cartier's dream. And you only have to look so far as the Alberta oil sands to see 
that we are still pursuing. We're still looking for the spices and the gold. We're still very much searching. Where are the spices? Where are the gold? Meanwhile, we've got Kanata right underneath it. Just, you know, we can still see it. We can still see Kanata. We're standing on it. Kanata is the place that exists in my auntie's house when she hands me that tea. It's the place in your family's houses when she, when your granny or your auntie or your uncle or your, your cousin gives you a hug at the front door. Kanata is still there. But we keep trying to build Canada. We keep trying to do it. And the, uh, the makers of that, what's, what's resulting in that is 1,200 murder missing Indigenous women, is massive overwhelming poverty is chronically underfunded First Nations education, is a broken Indian Act system that continues to draconian-like control the lives of Indians. It doesn't matter what part of my life that I live in, whether I live in you know, this life or when I die, I'm still a part of the Indian Act. I, when I die, I just enter another section. I'm stuck in it forever. And I keep trying to be, you know, keep being pushed into that. Well, enough is enough. 148 years of this country being premised on the idea of spices and gold is getting us nowhere. It's getting fractured, broken, horrendously bad relationships. And there's, there's promise, there's hope, because there's hope here. There's hope in this moment. There's hope in what we're thinking about right now. There's hope in the libraries that you work. You work in places where you can fundamentally change the country. How you open up your library, how you, you recognize and, and uh, indemnify power, how you, how you embody that within the texts that you choose to include can fundamentally change every single person that walks into your library. And you can make Canada even look like this if you want. Canada could look like this. Indigenous artists are all the time gift givers, all the time gift giving, continually, over and over and over again. And Indigenous artists over and over and over again are saying, Canada looks like this. Canada is the way, this is one way to look at Canada. Here's three different ways to look at Canada. They all are interconnected, but they all look unique. They come from different tribal nations, they come from different communities, they're over times and places. But yet they seem to be consistently saying the same message, and the message is that we are family, and that we're all here together and nobody's going home, nobody's going anywhere soon. We're all here, we're all in the house, but the foundation is very broken. So when we make these places, my hope is that we can begin to read, and we can read these places as also these places, that these places can be bridged, because that's what Indigenous peoples are, have been interested in for tens of thousands of years. And Indigenous peoples are profoundly interested in this, don't get me wrong. They're profoundly interested in reading and writing and text and the squiggles on the page. Just look at the uh, avalanche of Indigenous writers over the past three decades. You know, hundreds and hundreds of great writers, uh, you know, Joseph Boyden, Rosanna Deerchild, and Kate, Katerina Vermette, you know, all of these incredible writers who come out winning national awards a Buffy St. Marie just won the Polaris Prize. You know, all of these incredible... Uh, here's something that I'll give you hope for, just to, um, you know, as we, th as we think about Indigenous literatures, as we think about Indigenous peoples. Um, there's no people in this country who should be more angry and upset and feel more disenfranchised, more angry, and be more interested in, in you know, in breaking windows, in smashing things, than Indigenous people. There's really no people. There's a whole lot of reasons why you'd be angry. <laughs> uh, 60 scoop, residential school. But yet, during every single instance indigenous peoples, with the exception of a few moments where it's become very contentious, almost unilaterally, the Idle No More movement, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, um, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, almost every moment indigenous peoples have said, let's sit at the table and let's talk. The Kelowna Accord, I'm not saying, I'm not endorsing anybody's policy, but that was a great instance of everybody coming together and saying, let's have another talk. Let's, let's talk some more. Nobody wants to smash any windows. That's profound. That's, uh, there's hope for you right there. The indigenous peoples are engaged in a relationship. They're engaged in creating Kanata. Because indigenous literatures are constantly challenging us all to think about all these things. And what is literacy? Is that the fundamental premise, the fundamental center of it all? 
Indigenous peoples challenge our sense of reading and our writing. And lastly, our semiotics. How do we create signs that matter? So now, now you're going to go out and you're going to think about libraries. And I hope that you start to see, or maybe you already have, um, the Millennium Library in Winnipeg, which I've worked with a lot, uh, has done a really interesting, profound, uh, provocative, and exciting series of works that have incorporated notions of science and the natural world and indigenous knowledge into their very programming. It's very encouraging. And the most exciting thing of what all of that is, is that, that they've had this massive library rebuilding and they had an opportunity to reshape their entire library. And now they get, they have the largest uh, incoming interested readers that they've ever had. Probably a lot due to the, that programming, but also the other programming and the active and interesting people that they have working there. So when we look at this, we can see not just the land, but we can also see the waterways we can see a different place and that we can see a different way of seeing, a different way of reading. Because there's no other hope that we have than if we, than we have in our libraries. There's no, other, no, there's no other place I think better than our libraries in schools, our libraries in our communities, our libraries in this country, than places that reward, invest themselves and ultimately change our sense of knowledge. So with that, I say miigwech, and thank you very much for listening to me. And I guess there's some questions or something, so. Do you want me to stay up here, or what do you mean? Okay. Miigwech, um, Are those mics live? <laughs> nice. We have two kids of mics. They should be live. If you have questions, you can go to. As you, were, as you were talking, I was thinking about, can you hear me now? <laughs> the, the three books you mentioned at the start of your presentation. Sorry. The ones you've got apart from publishing. We, we have all three of those books in, in our library. They're part of what we call our, our native culture collection. So I have a bit of a, a two-part question. Um, the first one is, you know, when we catalog these books, we have to use a subject term or a subject heading. Very important to use it so all libraries have the same, yeah. you know, so we can all communicate that book gets tagged in the same way. And most of them use, you know, Indian for cannabis. Is that the official <laughs> terminology? And there's been a lot of discussion on changing that. There's some so called radical catalogers out there who don't use that. And we'll say Indigenous or Aboriginal, but, you know, the official today even remains Indian for Canada. And, you know, so I wanted to speak to that, you know, how we could. And it's, it's, it's almost like putting the, you know, putting the stake down and saying, you know, we're going to label this as that. And the second part would just be, you know, I'd like to call our collection the Indigenous Collection. And then I've been kind of going back between, like, you know, Aboriginal Collection. So, you know, setting aside a special collection in your library, but, you know, just wondering, you know, what to call it, what's the most appropriate terminology to use. And just wondering if you can speak to those issues. Yeah, there's a there's a whole host of different things like uh, that come up when you're talking there. Um, the first that um, why am I echoing so much? That's because of your microphone. Or, um, doesn't matter. So, oh, okay, I'll just talk from back here. Uh, so, like you know, you go to you go to uh, chapters, right? Or you go to Indigo, or you go to in Manitoba, it's McNally Robinson. You know, the the, the great bookstores. And um, until very recently, and even recently. Um, the number one place, so what are the most intellectual, creative, uh, the most important stories for Anishinaabe people or for Indigenous peoples as a whole? They're the, what we call the Atazuconic or the creation stories because the creation stories are the fundamental premise of how Anishinaabe see themselves, who they are, how they interrelate with the universe. 
Um, it's every single story that means life. And even the word adizuconic is talking about a being, an actual being. And where are those placed? Both children's literature. The most intellectual vessels amongst indigenous peoples are in children's literature. And I'm not insulting children's literature. I'm just saying that the way in which we, we invest power in that is highly problematic. Now, that's a history of the publishing industry too. And so, you know, I'm not, I'm not putting this, I'm not pegging this just on libraries, but I'm saying that that is a fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is the way in which we see indigenous knowledge and the way in which we see indigenous writing systems. Now, the other place you're going to find indigenous knowledge is in archaeology because there's been a massive plundering of, of uh, indigenous knowledge by academics and scholars of the whole, for the most part that have built careers off the exploitation of communities. So now the Indians of Canada is a part of that spectrum, right? Because the, the term Indian comes from, of course, the Indian Act, which comes from the document in 1876, which was meant to control uh, assimilate and ultimately exterminate Indians. There's an, uh, the extermination of Indians is in section six. So if Indians continue to procreate with non-Indians, doesn't matter if they're Indians or not, or if, if they're not listed in the Indian Act, then they ultimately are erased. So when you, when you use the term Indians of Canada, you represent and you, you know, institutionalize the notion of those notions that come from the Indian Act, which is that to control, to assimilate, and ultimately exterminate Indians. When you think about that, I hope now you've all reconsidered the term of Indians of Canada, right? Because, yeah, it's a legal term, and yeah, we've got to do something with it, but uh, the Indian Act's not going to be around much longer for the most part because there's such a cacophony, a wave of political anger towards the term Indian, but then also the term Indian Act. Some federal government's gonna find some political will, and I think this, this election may be a tipping point because this is the very first election I've ever heard ever where I hear three national leaders being forced to answer questions on indigenous peoples. Very first time in history. I, you know, I, I've, I'm a political bit of a political junkie, so I grew up on political science when I was, you know, when I was, I watched the NDP and Manitoba leader debates when I was 12. I don't know, everyone else is watching Transformers, right? So, but I've never heard, not one election, not ever, Indigenous issues raised as many times and as in complex ways as this election. So I think they're changing. So now what's, now what do you do now, right? So you're stuck with this kind of system and you move on. Well, there's really interesting, there's, you know, the, when at the Indigenous and Libraries Association that I was spoke at, they came up with an, an indigenous, indigenous cataloging system that represents individual communities, that represents individual tribal nations, um, and represents their knowledge in ways in which they're recognized as having value that here's a good, here's a two things that are worth thinking about and always worth remembering. The first is that indigenous nations are never unilateral. They're never, they're always multi-layered and always complex. The number one thing that indigenous peoples do well is disagree. That, and that's actually the most indigenous thing I've ever, I could ever say. You get two indigenous people in a room and they'll tell you two different creation stories. They'll both say, you know what they'll say at the end? He's right. That's what they'll say or maybe sometimes more passionately than that, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? So um, the point of it is, is there's a great story, I can't tell it now, but if you watch, uh, there's YouTube videos that I've told other lectures and things. Um, uh, there's one that I told, it, look for, it's called Two Fires, Two Center Fires to Creation. And it's a, it's a creation story that, uh, that I was told amongst the Cherokee. And, and um, the Cherokee have this great stories about there being two center fires of creation. What they actually mean is that there's multiple fires of creation. And that, you know, amongst the Anishinaabe creation story, when you have an elder that tells that story, um, the elder will often say, almost every elder I, I, uh, I respect says this at the end. It says that this creation story does not erase other, other creation stories. This is a creation story that's equal and valid as any other creation story in creation. Okay, so that's important, right? So that's the first lesson I wanted to, to sort of underline. First is that indigenous nations, you need to have a you know, bookshelf, a section on just the Anishinaabe. You could have that now. There is such, a, there is such an avalanche of writings of Anishinaabe. In my, in my um, office alone, I have three bookshelves of just Anishinaabe studies. My book, Centering Anishinaabe Studies, that was a shameless plug there. Um, 
uh, talks about all the different Anishinaabe people that you know are thinking about Anishinaabe-ness, and almost none of them agree. But that's the most amazing thing about being Anishinaabe, because the definition of Anishinaabe is, well, there's several defini definitions, but one of them is the spontaneous people, the people who are constantly recreating. And they're creating due to the world, the uh, influences, the engagements, but also themselves. That's what Anishinaabe means. It also means the good people, or it means the people that were lowered, a whole bunch of other things. Now, okay, so that's the first thing. Second is that libraries have, take a le are their leaders. Libraries have leadership roles to play, uh, much more than politicians. Oh my God, don't leave this to the politicians. And don't leave this to the universities. And because the universities are swept up in the politics of the politics of recognition and the politics of there's so many problems in the ways in which universities are able to negotiate knowledge and then influence. There's so many pro power problems, power dynamics that libraries can do this on their own. I think Indigenous is a good step. Aboriginal was a good step before. There's a whole contention of what do you call peoples. Um, the way that I think about it is Aboriginal is very much a Canadian thing. If you go internationally, you're not going to get people who understand what you're talking about. Whereas if you go to, if you say Indigenous internationally, people will get what you're talking about. But if you go to the United Nations, you start talking about Aboriginal people of Canada, they'll be like, is there Australians there? What's going on there? And so like, there's a whole sense of confusion around the term Aboriginal. But Aboriginal is also very encompassing. It's very specific to Canada, so it can be very useful because it's talking about, it's talking about First Nations, Inuit, Métis. Very few terms include Métis, and the Métis are, you know, there's no other body of people who, who have been more legally, socially, politically disenfranchised than the Métis. The Métis have the biggest struggles because they have, there's no document that even recognizes their, tre their treaties, their relationships. And the Indian Act, the first thing the Indian Act did was cut out the Métis. You know, so that you know, so those two steps I think are useful to being able to look at indigenous. But I think the indigenous classification system, amongst the uh, international librarians, Camille Callison has taken a leadership role in that. Um, who, of course, my colleague at University of Manitoba. That's I think it's provocative and it's interesting, and it's certainly worth talking about. It's certainly worth bringing you know uh, someone like that who knows that kind of knowledge in for to speak with. Um, service providers such as yourselves who are dealing uniquely and in, you know specifically with indigenous communities because I want you to imagine now you got some young Anishinaabe kid coming in and he is very first time he's, he'll say to you like my daughter my daughter's nine she'll say I'm Anishinaabe uh, you know I'm so proud of that and you know how hard it took for me to get her there like because she's got to watch Pocahontas and those other crapola you know what I mean like like I gotta get her to a, to a point of pride in herself because and you got to defeat all the other stuff. This the whole country is based on the idea of the Indian Act and the, and the erasing individual tribal identity. We don't even recognize indigenous words. You know, uh, I say to people, "What does Canada mean? Where does it come from?" And and very rarely do I get people, a majority of people who understand that's a that's an Iroquoian word or Manitoba that that's an Anishinaabe Cree word, and uh, or Winnipeg is a Cree word as well. And so when I say you know Anishinaabe Cree people have made you who you are. People are like, no, they're not. What are you talking about? I get all that, and I finally get my daughter to walk into a place and go, you know what? I'm Anishinaabe, and that's awesome. And then you turn, and she looks at the section, Indians of Canada. And I'm like, damn it. Now you're the problem, too, and I got I to gotta fight that, too. You know, I got I to gotta put pride in who she is and teach her who she is. So, you know, do it for her. She deserves it. Was there another question? That was, I give long-winded answers to, uh, so. Oh, okay, well, the, uh, the Cree and the Anishinaabe, um, one of the reasons why they use floral designs is because it's a unique relationship with the landscape but it's also about marking yourself. So one of the first things that Columbus recognized, I actually gave a lecture on this the other day, uh, what are the two things that Columbus recognized first about indigenous peoples? But first of all, he noticed that they were naked. That's what he says in his journal. He goes, they were clothed provocatively. It doesn't quite use that word, but he basically says they were naked. And then the second thing that he just says, they had a lot of tattoos and their hair is kind of funny. That's what he says, Columbus writes. 
Now, if you take the representation of Indigenous peoples over the past 500 years, take Pocahontas, take Dances with Wolves, take every single representation from comic strips in the 19th century, which I'll talk a little bit about in my Indigenous graphic novel talk this afternoon at one, or you know any semiotic that involves Indigenous peoples, they can be broken up into two, two categories, sexualized images or images of violence. And it starts with Columbus on day one. Day one. And so, uh, these images are different than that. They're not sexualized images. They're not images of um, you know, violence. These are images of relationships to territory. These are land claims. That's what, that's what when you, so when you see a, a moccasin and you see a particular flower that a family uses, that's their, that's their relationship with that territory. Or if you see a, uh, if you see a, 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 a drum with a stone that's used specifically, I carry a stone with me. And that comes from a specific place in the Great Lakes where I've gained a lot of teachings. So I'm deeply tied to that one place where these stones are created. Um, these, that's writing. That's, those are land claims. Those are, now they're not land claims in the way in which we think of ownership or slamming a, a 30 foot cross into the earth. They're different kinds of family relationships. They're the kind that I'm talking about in my auntie's house in 2015. That's the kind of relationships I'm talking about when I carry that stone or when I wear these. Um, the woman who made this for me, uh, may be watching right now because she's a wonderful, wonderful lady. Um, but uh, yes, I, the relationship that I have with her is very important, you know, as a friend and as, as a colleague and as somebody I really respect. So, the Spillett family in Manitoba, if you know who, they, who those people are. Okay, I think there's still five minutes. I don't know. Hmm. You're talking to a Sinclair? <laughs> Uh, yeah, like I think the the connection between indigenous writing systems and royal crests or family crests um, have been always very provocative for me. Now, now my book is coming out next year uh, on Anishinaabe dotems, right? On the, on the, the intellectual vessels of Anishinaabe dotems and their influences in literature, um, and that's what I say. But but I, I what I my my very cursory understanding of of kilts is that the the color. The connection, the the fabric, all have a lot to do with families and the ways in which families come together, much like the Métis sash. I think that there's a lot of connection. There's a provocative, interesting things there. Okay. Yeah. I just I wanted to uh, make a comment. Uh, I feel like I got to ask a question about collections. And recently, I'm from Henry Sound. And recently, we um, had a donation from the Sox uh, regarding the residential schools, and we decided to put it in a collection. And at first I called it First Nation because, well, that wasn't exactly right. So it's called Special Collections. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it's all these writings put together in one section in our library. And uh, we had a ceremony to honor it and a painting to put up in honor of it. And people from the community, because our community is somewhat separated from the people that live on the island and Perry Sound, uh, but we had a special uh, uh, celebration of the collection. Uh, with the smudging and, and various things going on. And people from the community came up for weeks after and were so touched by it that they had not had any of that kind of experience, right? And I find it kind of really sad how we live in these little um, fight films or whatever. Like, you know, we have these barriers. Um, and I just wanted to say that, um, you know, Michael, you spoke about the collection. I had a very old woman, white hair, I'll call her Edith. That's not a real name to protect her. Uh, and anonymity comes to me and say, and we have it in a very prominent location, this collection. She said, I have been reading books from this collection. I never would have even seen these. And she had read um, some of Richard Wagamese's books. And she said, I had no idea of this story. This is unbelievable. And she was so, it was so touching as somebody who works in a library and is always trying to think of how we do things and how to do things in the best way. And I just want to encourage other libraries to, to, to try things. You know, there's always like this line of being politically correct and putting yourself out there. What I end up doing with our collection is we call it special collection and you can't buy from Road Art or anything a sticker, right? We have stickers. We love stickers at libraries. I have to make my own and it's an eagle. So when you're um, putting the books away, you know if it's an eagle book, it goes in this collection. And with its prominence in the library, 
that story, I feel like, is being heard better in our community. And I'm really, you know, I just encourage other lenders to try that. Yeah, great. Uh, so you did this, right? So I mean, this is which. If there's a if there's a story that explains this, that's a good story. Um, one is that the uh, another one is that you've uh, by using the term eagle or or mega Z, I mean, you're what you're talking about. The, think about the symbols that you're using. So the the mega Z, two things the mega Z does is the mega Z flies highest in the sky, so so the mega Z can see the most territory. And so there's really nothing that describes a book better. Right, that, that can see the most in terms of relationships are the intricacies, like the sharpest intricacies in relationships, but also the general picture of how it all works. That's what eagles do, right? So eagles have those out that those, that power. But the second is that the eagle is a gift giver, so the, the the eagle gifts leadership. That's what the eagle gives. And so, and those are in depth, those are recognized in the filaments of the of the feathers. So the way the feather is able to stick together and make that's what that's what leaders do. Right? So that's why an eagle can fly because an eagle can't fly like this. So an eagle flies because the filaments of the feathers bring together. So that's um, Richard actually talks about this. Is who taught that? Who taught me that is Richard Wegemies. So Richard's a friend of mine. So the feathers, when they're together, that's what the eagle teaches. That that's what leaders do. That's why uh, eagles will gift a feather to a leader or an, an ogima amongst our people. So that's an important thing to recognize. And I think that. Um, think about the symbol that you used for that. You may not even know that you used it, but you did. So it's for me, it's the Migazi collection, right? So that's good. Um, but those kind of ways of thinking about names and the ways in which you celebrate knowledge and honor knowledge, you did all of that with your, with your, especially with the smudge ceremony, right? But then also with all the different parts, inviting the community in, um, listening to that elder who told you about their their uh, in, interest in that collection. Um, the, there may be some there may be some people interested in you know the name special collection, but Indigenous peoples have a special relationship with Canada. It's unique. No other culture, no other groups of people, no other share that relationship. It's called treaties, right? Or often treaties, but in non-treaty areas, it's called Aboriginal rights, right? So, but special and unique relationships with the country. So those are all things that are recognized within that library. It sounds exciting. It sounds great. Wait, oh. Miguel was telling me a couple of stories before we started this morning. 